Hi everybody, it's Sunday afternoon. Uh, Rob Watson here. Um, this is a I've, I've never actually recorded a PowerPoint presentation like this, so uh, it might go wrong. I don't know. Uh, it, it should be OK. Uh, but what I want to do is I spend a little bit of time going through the uh, key framework for content, which is the Ofcom broadcast code, uh, the general issues about legal uh, media law and the impress guide to uh, uh, the, sorry the impress standards uh, if a member of the public wants to make a complaint so I'm going to try and get through this in about 50 minutes maximum and if um, you, you could sit and listen uh, the slides uh, there's quite a bit of text in the slides uh, so I'll provide a copy of the slides uh, and I'll post them to the, our Google Drive. And I've also produced a written guide, which is takes the information that's in the slides, but puts it in a written form that you can use as well. The kind of a reference point uh, to be able to uh, refer back to this if you need to. But the main thing is I'm just going to cover the kind of key issues of what we think about when we're looking at broadcast content and how that's regulated and how it is um, structured and and, regu uh, and and governed by a set of rules and practices so <coughs> so the first question is what is the broadcasting code well the broadcasting code is established in law it's regulated by ofcom and it's a set of provisions that give minimum standards for programs sponsorship product placement fairness and privacy uh, as you might Kind of, kind of be aware of that our press is not regulated in the same way we don't have a statute we we don't have a legal organization that regulates our press but broadcasting is regulated by a, a, a by ofcom as a, if you like an enforcement body that can impose fines uh, and it sets out a code of practice and it holds people to quite a high standard uh, and that code is known as the Ofcom Broadcasting Code. And in the UK, Ofcom is the principal media regulator. And it covers a number of incorporates some other forms of reg regulation. So it doesn't just stand by itself, but it's part of a wider, um, a, a wider use of uh, media law and civic rights law and, and uh, uh, human rights law. So the uh, Terrorism Act 2000, uh, Human Rights Act 1998. These are based on the Human European Convention on Human Rights, uh, the Communications Act of 2003, the Equalities Act of 2010, the Official Secrets Act, those kind of things. They inform and provide a framework in which the Broadcasting Code uh, sits. So it's not just seen as something that acts by itself, but it's subject to other laws as well. And the basis of the whole principle of regulation in the UK is that the person who has the license for a radio station or a TV station, a media provider, is responsible for making sure that the comp that the content they put out, <coughs> excuse me, is compliant with the regulations. And that it doesn't, uh, it's not likely to cause general offence or distress. Uh, that's the basic principle of uh, regulation. And it, in the in the regulations, it's then defined as to what that that offence or distress might mean, and who it might mean that it affects different people in different ways. And Ofcom are the arbiters, if you like, of of what that definition is, and they base that on uh, regular surveys and regular case law and red, regular uh, updated information to come to an idea of what causes offence and what causes distress in the general population. And that changes over time, but only slowly, and we, we're not seeing much change at the moment. So just as a kind of quick warning, there might be some bad language uh, or references to sexualised content in this presentation. I can't off the top of my head think that there's going to be very much, but uh, we're going to skip through it. Uh, but it's always worth keeping in mind that um, when we're training to think about uh, the use of you know, what might be distressing or offensive material. So if you've got your kids and you're listening to this on a pair of speakers or something like that, you might want to put your headphones on as a reasonable precaution. So the main thing that we're thinking about is what the basic points are for radio. 
and we're trying to anticipate what would be our uh, key key issues that we need to consider when we're uh, planning radio or a radio station any kind of radio station broadcast radio station in the uk it's, this doesn't include web stations and online stations just uh, broadcast so that's fm am dab that kind of thing uh, what are the main points first of all you've you're accountable so you, we know who you are and that there's a named person and that there's a legal entity behind the broadcaster our number one priority is the protection of children and i'll go into this in a bit more detail in a bit that we're not causing offense uh, and that it's not personal or su or subject it's sorry the definition of offense isn't personal or subjective but it's defined in the surveys that ofcom undertakes and the legal rulings that are given out so that there isn't any harm that comes to crime anti you know we're not promoting criminal activity or antisocial behavior uh, that there's a sense of fairness so that people have a right to respond that we're not covering issues partially uh, although there are, you know there's there's editorial just just uh, distinctions to be made to be made about some of these things but we're generally covering things and giving people a right to reply and that when it comes to a matter of public controversy we're offering a kind of balanced content but also that we're respecting people's privacy and that we're not going for we're not intruding in people's in people's lives uh, bear with me <coughs> oh goodness me halfway through. I'm not going to start again because I've sneezed but there we go uh, sneeze and then uh, re most importantly accuracy is that what we're doing is our information is accurate and that it's uh, information that's available in the public domain and that there's a separation between opinion and fact and then uh, maybe not related to what we're, we're dealing with but commercial communication such as advertising and uh, uh, sponsorship those kind of things so the Ofcom broadcast code sits within a framework of legislation but it also sits within a framework of established media law so you've got to consider how the Ofcom broadcast code sits in relation to slander and, and libel in the courts you're still subject to uh, slander claims of slander and libel uh, you're still a distributor of public information uh, and the Ofcom code does not protect you from uh, accusations of slander and libel uh, you're still subject to the Official Secrets Act so you can't unnecessarily uh, reveal prescribed information and you're also subject to whatever emergency regulations come into play at a time of crisis and you know, that's something that is uh, important to consider at the moment as we've been you know through the pandemic and through the lockdown uh, and Ofcom have put a mass a, a massive amount of effort and energy into squashing some of the uh, wilder claims about things like you know conspiracy theories and 5g uh, theories uh, which are you know patently untrue uh, but have some currency in some uh, circles uh, but are not deemed as responsible acts for broadcasters to uh, regurgitate so this comes down to then what is the program makers responsibility so it's our responsibility as content makers and we're taking this responsibility on on behalf of the radio stations that we are pr providing content for so we've got to be fully aware of this so it's our responsibility to comply with the code um, if we need further advice about the, the, the code and uh, then there are people that we could talk to uh, I've got some experience each of the station managers at the stations have got some experience and it's not just down to an individual's opinion but it's something which is um, clearly uh, identified as being objective information that's verified from verifiable sources and not just hearsay and rumor uh, what we've got to do is uh, at all times ensure that the audience isn't fooled into thinking that a viewpoint that is expressed is irrefutably true um, because it's you know it's it's just because you saw it on YouTube or you saw it on TikTok doesn't make it true if it comes from Public Health England or the Office for National Statistics that's a reasonable organization that determines that the, the truth of what they're putting out is verifiable 
so when we put together our content and put together programs and material that goes into programs there's a number of questions that we should ask uh, first of all is it likely to upset any children who might be listening is it likely to mislead are the facts accurate if they're presented as facts and if there isn't 100% certainty that any of the, uh, these things are facts is there an attribution to the source so if it's a discussion and there's some debatable reference refer to you know if somebody says well this was taken from the i don't know the uh, uh the, the lancet the the british medical journal those kind of sources then you're on fairly safe ground to know that there's some verification have gone into those journals and there's some peer review it's not entirely satisfactory and secure as a, as a model uh, but generally we can clearly attribute our sources so the rule of thumb is make keep it clean keep it uncontroversial uh, and, and controversy is really about being um, by inst politically or institutionally biased we'll go into this in a bit more detail shortly make sure it's honest so it's it's as you know these facts as and you've got the you know a note of where it is that you got these facts from and then is it fair to each of the parties that take part in this so what you're not doing is uh, if you make a claim that you know somebody isn't abiding by certain rules that you then have they have the opportunity to to put their point of view their side of the discussion as the the the, the facts uh, as they see it as well so all broadcasters have to keep a record of what goes out uh, a record of transmission it can be a data file a tape uh, and if there's a complaint to Ofcom about something that's broadcast they will ask for a record of that transmission and they'll use that uh, one of the main reasons that community radio stations in the past have been fined is that they've not kept their records of transmission and that they've got no uh, way of verifying what was what was said at a particular point and that that incurs quite a large fine so <clears throat> thinking about applying the code is ofcom has to take a number of things into context and we're talking thinking about what a kind of list of a criteria in no particular order it considers all of these things as they interact with each other so what is the degree of harm and offense that's likely to be caused by the inclusion of any particular source of material in programs uh, or of a particular description of a program and so from that um, the Ofcom will then consider the size and composition of the potential audience uh, who who is likely to be listening and then also what the expectations of the that audience are likely to be so if you're doing a late night uh, phoning uh, politics discussion on a, a radio station generally you're expecting that children aren't listening at that time of the evening so the topics could be uh, more open and more adult referenced than they would do in the daytime radio doesn't have a watershed television tends to have a watershed around between 9 and 10 p.m. where you can expect that after 10 p.m. the content is likely to be more of an adult nature uh, children often listen to rate or used to listen to radio in bed uh, so it's regarded that children might be listening at any time uh, but there are things that you can do in terms of flagging uh, and letting the audience know what kind of content there is that's going to be on a program uh, but we're not planning to do anything that's controversial so it probably doesn't apply to us um, <clears throat> so if the audience is pre-warned that's not a sold that's not a defense by itself because if somebody is flipping through the dial or driving through the town and they pick up the signal of a radio station then they mightn't be aware that this was the kind of program it was they might just stumble across it and be shocked by the content uh, so it's it's you know what what is there in the programming structure that allows people who are unaware of the nature of the program to understand it in context um, and then the desirability uh, of a change affecting the nature of the service um, how relevant is it you know what what you know who, who it, it, there might be desirable issues socially desirable issues that you want to cover and that that has a, a, a 
a public interest, if you like, tied in with an, you know, that you've got editorial independence over the content. So the one thing that you don't want is to be uh, subject to somebody else's uh, concerns. And as program makers, you're entirely independent about the uh, the content that you produce and you're not uh, under pressure from anybody else to change uh, or apply that content in different ways. The main issue that Ofcom are faced with often is the uh, offensive language issues. So do, uh, you know, the kind of use of language in programs, which often, you know, rate, just because it says on a music track that you've downloaded from iTunes that it's uh, radio friendly, that's an American thing. It doesn't mean there isn't offensive language in it. It just means that it's been edited and mixed so it's suitable for radio. It doesn't mean to say that any of the offensive language in it has been taken out. So Ofcom really do look at, you know, if you're playing music that has got... Um, uh, offensive language in there and the time it goes out it's one of the areas that stations often get unstuck because they don't have a such strong control over their playlist um, and when you plan to use anything if you kind of want to geek out on this there's a really good resource which Ofcom published which is their latest information about their uh, actions it's the broadcast on demand bulletin and they publish it on a regular basis about every two weeks as a new edition comes out with their latest decisions and it explains each each um, adjudication or dismissal of a complaint is given some full background in the broadcast demand bulletin uh, so that's always well worth uh, having a look at sections under the code I'll skip through these, some of them more relevant than others, but at, and at various times, different ones are more relevant than the others. Uh, section one is protecting the under 18s. Uh, and that's slightly different in terms of the word and about select, uh, protecting children because between 16 and 18, not necessarily classed as children, uh, but are classed as still protecting the under 18s because you've got less legal rights as a person who's under 18. Section two is harm and offence. Section three is crime, disorder, hatred and abuse. Section four is religion. Section five is due impartiality and due accuracy. Section six is elections and referendums. Section seven is fairness. Uh, sorry, section six is important because there are going to be elections taking place over the next few weeks and months. Section eight is privacy. Uh, section nine is commercial references on TV, so we can ignore that. And section 10 is commercial communications on radio so i'm going to skip this slide because it's asking questions uh, so section one protection of the under 18s really we've just got to make sure that the content is suitable for an audience who've got the capacity and the moral development to uh, uh, cope with and to understand the type of programming and parents particularly are very sensitive you know, if you imagine on the school run in the car in the morning that uh, a song comes on that is full of uh, double entendres and profanities, the children might be, you know, the parents might be embarrassed by asking with by their children asking because children really do listen, they really do take it in. Uh, we might not think that children are listening, even young children, we might not think that they're listening, but they have very open ears to hear. A lot of this content and it's you know so the expectation is during the daytime particularly is that it's family friendly and it's inclusive and particularly that there isn't any anything in there which is likely to uh, cause harm uh, to children from from included so that includes things like uh, you know portrayal of drugs smoking solvents and alcohol you never glamorize these things you never uh, portray them in a in an attractive light in a dramatic context you, you know what happens is people show the consequences of people uh, taking drug drugs particularly in children's program but it's it's sensitively handled uh, what you don't do is just you know kind of it's not a late night uh, uh, program celebrating the virtues of, of, of all of these things <clears throat> it's it's saying that children could be corrupted and tempted to try smoking or alcohol it's not what we're about. Violence and dangerous behaviour, likewise, you know, not not protect you know, children under eighteen, people under eighteen 
shouldn't be encouraged to use offensive language or to trade in sexual material uh, and things like demonstrations of exorcisms and cult practices shouldn't be uh, uh, included in children's programming and then also about how people under the age of 18 are included in programs so you know where permission comes from and that comes through in, a, in our safeguard and policy um, yeah, so stay some stations uh, have um, got into trouble with this in the past and I'll the, when you get to see the slides you can look at some examples but I'll, I'll keep them whizzing through because I'm aware of the time uh, section two is harm and offence. Uh, so our main criteria here is we're not going to mislead our audience, uh, but the con and um, the content that we put out can be justified by the context. So it may include um, references to violence, sexual violence, humiliation, distress, violation of human dignity. There might be a topic that covers some of these issues, but it's done in such a way that it's editorially uh, sensitively managed so it isn't thrown around and mocked or it isn't thrown you know, somebody's concerns and there's 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 for example at the moment there's issues about people's mental health and as we come out of lockdown and the temptation in some of the if you like the more laddish type of uh, uh round the table or or phone in type programs often could be you know kind of veered towards a kind of you know uh, um disrespect for people's uh who, who they are what they are and there's examples of uh, uh people who've been fined stations program makers that have been fined because they've been mocking people because they're uh they, they, they're, they're um cross-gendered it's um it's it's those kind of things that we we stay away from it doesn't mean to say we can't talk about them and deal with them as social issues of social concern um but what we don't do is we don't belittle people or we don't make assumptions about people on that basis and they're protected not just in the broadcasting code but also in the equal equalities legislation uh, that the code is uh, subject to. so what we're looking for is the idea that we're not condoning or glamorizing violence dangerous or seriously antisocial behavior so again any kind of mentions of things like suicide or self-harm must be editorial editorially justified by the context so you know we, we have to think very carefully about and, and you know there was a big controversy about this a few years ago about the you know instagram uh, giving access to people to uh, sites and, and and feeds and uh, uh, accounts where self-harm uh, was and was seen as a as a regular uh, occurrence and that was you know that there was a lot of pressure put on to the social media companies to to exclude this kind of content because uh, it couldn't be justified so <clears throat> things like uh, uh, taking place in competitions uh they must be for, we're not doing any competitions but you know it's, it's it's fairness you you must have a clear chance of winning if you take part in a competition so section three is crime disorder hatred and abuse and the principle here is to make sure that the material is not likely to encourage or incite the commission of crime or lead to disorder so if you were you know saying on your program let's all head down to leicester clock tower and we'll have a, 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 a we'll, we'll organize a, a a rally about this and we're going to protest about this it's not actually uh, it's something that a radio station can or should do if you were interviewing somebody who was doing that as part of a news feature and you were trying to get into the issues you could put the alternative you know the question would be what does protest you know what does the disruption that's caused by protest uh, uh, lead to you can put the counter argument uh, Ofcom is not asking you to stay away from these issues but it's asking you to handle them in a particular way so we're not here to encourage or incite any kind of crime or that might lead to disorder um, and uh, whether it's directly or indirectly uh, you know th th there's you know somebody rings in and says oh what was you know what was your proudest moment oh it was when I was shoplifting from boots you know we're not here to you know that's the, that that could actually get you a knock on the door by the police because you've identified yourself with with a crime it has happened uh, and we're not here to 
promote any kind of encouragement or engagement in terrorism. And there's been instances where uh, uh, some radio stations, community radio stations uh, are subject to this, uh, tends to happen more often, playing uh, sermons that were taken off YouTube, which were basically rallying cries for terrorist organisations. And that causes a lot of uh, a, a lot of concern and they get you know, heavy fines. Uh, and some stations have been closed down because they just didn't check material, uh, which is not, which which, which was, in, was was based on incitement or based on hate speech. Uh, now th there's a you know, an editorial justification for strong, robust discussion, uh, but when it veers into hate speech, uh, that is uh, is a different matter, and that's handled. I think if it was an issue of hate speech, it would be handled by the police rather than by Ofcom, uh, but Ofcom have provision for that in the broadcast code. <clears throat> so things like, you know, what the, you know, the meaning of hate speech is defined in the code, the meaning of terrorism is defined in the code, the meaning of crime is defined in the code, and uh, the meaning of disorder is defined in the code. Uh, so uh, we hopefully will not be uh, covering any of those topics um, because we're, that's not the kind of content that we're aiming to create but it's just well worth being aware of where the boundaries are and what the expectations are. Uh, and if we do want to cover a topic, uh, so, you know, one of the issues that the, the census is throwing up is identification of uh, your, you know, your self identification of your identity, whether it's your ethnicity, your nationality, whether it's your uh, sexuality, your gender, uh, you know, those kind of issues. Uh, you know they they need to be discussed and portrayed uh, and they need to be engaged with but uh, what toler you know where is the limit to you know the kind of tolerant respectful uh, discussion of these things uh, so at all times on this problem at uh, this project we're taking a, a very respectful kind of view so <clears throat> crime and disorder is we're you know we're, we're keeping the public away from offensive and harmful material uh, and it, again speech can be included where it's justified by the context uh, so if, if a politician has a meltdown or is uncovered you know like Donald Trump was was basically you know a lot of his stuff was racist but you're reporting on what that person's speech was about and there is an argument about being an echo chamber and uh, you know, kind of an amplifier of that kind of hatred and that kind of speech, you know, you know dis despicable kind of speech. Uh, our job is not there to be the arbiters of that, uh, but is to be, um, uh, you know, make sure that what it, the way that it's presented isn't isn't done in a way which is derogatory to it, individuals or group. Some of the stations that we're working with are going to are of a religious basis, some aren't. And there is a, a degree of responsibility that we have to take into account when it comes to religious programming. Uh, one of the things that our programming material can't do or religious programming can't do is give a sense to the audience that, um, you know, things that are said are, if you like, scientific fact as opposed to uh, religious opinion uh, and that there is a responsibility so if you said you know you know off the top of my head this is a, probably a bad example you know you're you're suffering from cancer don't go to your hot don't go to your GP don't go to the hospital uh, do this prayer and do this uh, um, uh, uh, drink this this blessed water for example now that that might be part of your religious belief uh, but it's not what we can broadcast because this, the, you're leading the susceptibility of the audience to think that the religion, religious view can provide answers for a medical problem, which isn't justified. Now, Ofcom are very clear about that. Uh, it's not saying to people that you can't say that this could be part of the way that you practice your faith and religion and that you deal with. Uh, uh, but it, it, what you can't do is say, and there's been examples of this with COVID where, you know, it, it's it's you know, pure and impure, impure uh, actions and thoughts and behaviours that are responsible for COVID um, and not the other way. You know, it's, it's quite clear that it's a, 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 
physical uh, it's a phenomenon of medical concern not of religious concern and and that's uh you know we bringing that out in the program again it's talking to people about their what informs them but we've got to be better informed about that and we don't put any religions through any kind of abusive treatment we don't belittle anybody any religions uh, and so you're not identifying a religion to uh, demonize that religion uh, so and if, if if a topic is of a religious nature you just need to identify that clearly with the audience uh, and what you can't do is promote a religious view by stealth uh, so you can't uh, you know kind of <coughs> over time tell people that the reason that they're wealthy is because they follow you know kind of the success that they have uh, is is because they follow a particular faith you've got to show the evidence uh, and you've got to be transparent about that but you can seek recruits to a faith or a religion uh, through radio which you can't do on television but you can through radio right <clears throat> where are the time uh, section five is due impartiality and this is quite important and the principle is to ensure that um, we are reflecting news and information that is accurate and is presented without any particular significant bias. Now, that's a very kind of open kind of thing to think about. But uh, we, we regard the main sources of information, uh, the BBC, uh, our expectation is that the government, the, the government agencies like the Office for National Statistics are not lying to us. We might say that about the Chinese government or the Russian government, but we're not saying that about our own government unless there is significant evidence that is in the public domain from well qualified sources such as the BBC, the large news gathering organisations, you know, kind of Reuters. Uh, the Associated Press, those kind of things. If you make a mistake with something, and we're not going down that route in terms of uh, tackling big issues, you know, this is this is about community reporting. If you tack, if you do make a mistake on air, you correct it as soon as you can, you know, as and and as quickly as you can. Uh, sometimes you can misspeak, and and uh, that 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 just needs to be corrected. Uh, and if it's a if it's a bigger problem because you've received a complaint, uh, then a, cor a correction should be scheduled um, uh, clearly. <clears throat> so the idea of kind of political or industrial controversy, uh, which is out there in the public debate, debate, we need to be balanced about that, and we need to be uh, not taking any one particular side uh, on these issues. So you have to get a range of and, and how this is defined is uh, not necessarily just within one program, but across the whole range of programs. So if you listen to a station like LBC, they tend to justify their editorial biases within their programs because they say, well, the next presenter takes a different view. So James O'Brien in the morning takes a, 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 a left wing view and you know Nick Farage. Uh, I think he's on just before. Is he on that station? I'm not sure he's on that station. Takes a different view. Um, that seems to be the model that is emerging through British radio. Uh, the BBC does uh, uh, impartiality within a programme, and that t kind of ties the BBC up in knots sometimes. If it's a personal view, you've just got to make sure that it's 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 referenced and understood by the listener as a, an authored view. It's a you know it's it's a, like an essay or it's like a, a an observation report, um, and that you are expressing you know opinions. Um, and again, there's, there's don't ever confuse news with with, um, uh, with opinion try and keep the two separate uh, elections and referendums now normally I skip over this point but we are in a period of referend uh, uh, election we've got I think in Leicestershire we've got the police and crime commissioners so we're subject to the uh, broadcasting rules about uh, elections and it's just making sure that any coverage that a station carries out is uh, apolitical at this point so it, it gives all of the parties an equal time to relate content uh, within their the boundaries of what the areas that they cover, we've got the police and crime commissioners. So if we 
if, if we couldn't just interview one of the candidates for the Police and Crime Commissioner, we'd have to interview all of the candidates and make that content available to the stations who would use all, you know, the, they'd probably take that with all of the statements from the Police and Crime Commissioners, and that might be a good thing to do. So fairness is the, is really making sure that people have you know, just treatment and that they're not treated or individuals or organisations are not treated unfairly um, and that are the dealings with people. So we've, you know, one of the classic things is you put a microphone in somebody's face and you say, tell us, you know, tell us your views on X, Y or Z. And they say, well, where's it going out? And, you know, you, you don't tell them or you record surreptitiously. You, you, there is a defence that you can do that on the basis of the public interest but we're not engaging in journalism uh, and usually it would be journalists qualified journalists who uh, have an indemnity insurance to do that kind of reporting so we're always open and transparent you're invited to make a contribution and what you don't do is you don't say this program is going to be about um, the census but it ends up you, know, you invite the mayor on you say oh, we're going to talk about the census and why it's important and what you end up with is talking about um, you know being caught up a ladder uh, during the uh, during the lockdown he might turn around and say well actually I'm not gonna you know you've not given me the full information that I needed to take part of this program so you've got to be clear and if somebody needs an explanation about why they were asked to contribute, uh, you, you know, they'll, they, they're able to follow. Um, so section seven is, uh, is fairness informed about the type of questions and the possibly na possible nature of the questions. Um, I, I don't tend to give people specific questions in advance when I'm doing a podcast, but I do give them a general indication. Uh, some people ask for more specific questions, but then it loses the spontaneity. Uh, if I was a journalist and I was, uh, you know, you want to protect what those questions, you, you, you maybe give them a, you know, a couple of questions that you, you kind of want to start off with, and then you follow up with a more you know, specific question that you've got to them. Uh, but that's if it's a person who's in the public domain, who's in the public, you know, a celebrity or a politician, or, you know, somebody who is uh, subject to uh, issues of public concern. Um, if it's just an ordinary member of the public and you start interrogating them about their opinions or their views or their behaviours, they could really regard that as being unfair uh, and, and, and a, uh, you haven't been clear with them about what that material is going to be used for. Likewise, if, if you do talk to somebody and you take that material but it ends, ends up being used for something completely different that they deem as being unrelated to what you originally contracted contacted them with to talk about they they would have a, uh, a a legitimate concern and then section eight is privacy which is really making sure that you know it, we, we keep what is in the public domain in the public domain and what is private people can reveal certain things about themselves but they don't have to um, so things like you know kind of where somebody you know the specific address where somebody lives lives try not to identify that um you know the the it, you know, at the moment as well a lot of families might be affected by uh you know kind of bereavements or illnesses uh through the pandemic uh, uh there might be mental health issues that people face so you've got to be aware of the kind of um sensitivities that are regarded as being private uh, that are not the concern of people uh, in the public domain Unless, of course, they wish to make that uh, uh, information that they wish to share because it's useful for other people to learn from that experience. That is fine. But you just make sure that there's consent uh, before that is applied and then set consent before that is broadcast. Uh, so what you're not doing is taking somebody's private information and then using that uh, without any regard for the impact that that, you know, that information being made public so if somebody tells you that they've been having an affair uh, and their partner doesn't know about this and they've not told their family and it gets broadcast they would be rightly uh, you know concerned that you know it was something that they didn't really want to go in the public domain uh, and so we we you know unless it was a senior you know uh, a public figure or a uh, you know celebrity then we wouldn't really you know then it would be news but it's not the ordinary people it's not news at all 
So pr privacy is all based on consent. Uh, the section eight is based on consent. And usually we can we consider in broadcasting terms the acknowledgement that, you know, you're being recorded, you know, we're going to record this session, we're talking over Zoom, you're sending me material over WhatsApp, um, that is your implied consent. We don't have to go and get specific forms filled. If they know who you are and where they can contact you, so, you, you know, you just be clear, give them your email address or a phone number, a contact point, or to, you know, say, I'm from Leicester Stories, if you want to go and find out where the... Um, uh, you know the website is this or the email address is this that means that if they've got a complaint and they're not sure about what they have uh, set, you know what they've given um, then they've got somewhere to go uh, to get that information uh, don't go talking to people who are in a state of distress um, don't reveal the identity of anyone who's you know kind of victims of crime or victims of um, uh, you know, kind of been injured or anything like that and saying a road accident, uh, kind of that's not our job. We're, we're not again, we're not journalists, we're community reporters, uh, but do give people an indication of where the, the, the content is going to be used and where it's going to be used for. Um, under, under 16s and vulnerable people, we have to pay a bit more attention to, but we have a safeguard and policy for that as well. Uh, so people, the idea of giving informed consent, there's nothing wrong with us including children and vulnerable people within our, um, our program content. Uh, we just have to get permission from somebody who's a suitable parent or guardian. Um, and we wouldn't use that without that either, you know, kind of verbal or um, uh, written consent from them. So section 10, commercial communications, really basically we're not, you know, just steer, steer clear of advertising any products. Uh, we're not being sponsored by anybody. Well, we are being, the, the project has been um, uh, set up by uh, obviously the university, uh, but we're not being told that we have to mention DMU. In fact, you know, we, we, we will not mention the fact that we're, uh, um, uh, that will be on the website, but on, on air, uh, there is no need for us to mention. We're not here to promote or, or, or give any kind of commercial reference to uh, any of the, 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 the organizations that have funded the project. We keep that completely separate. Uh, but we, if somebody asks a question about it, we can provide them with the information of where we've been supported. Um, fundraising activity, this one. So what to do if things go wrong? Got about nine minutes left if I'm on time. Um, if things go wrong, um, Ofcom will ask for a recording. They'll ask how did the situation arise? They'll ask was it predictable or planned in advance? Uh, what procedures did you have to pl in place to stop it happening? Uh, what was done to remedy it? Uh, where apologies broadcast? How did you react to any complaint received to the station? Was the presenter disciplined? How are you ensuring it won't happen again? So there's all of these questions that the station manager uh, will be asked initially because the station manager, the broadcast station, is who the complaint will be to and will be about, not us. We're, we are com we're supplying them with material. So we're aware that we don't want to get the station managers into any kind of difficulty if a complaint is raised because we've ensured that the material that we're producing and providing uh, is, is suitable for broadcast and has been pre-checked and pre-cleared. Um, so they're kind of a checklist of things that you'll maybe ask yourself before we put content together. Will your program have any content involving children? Uh, is it directed towards children? Um, are children likely to be listening at that time? Is there only going to be kind of adult topics covered in the content? Again, that doesn't preclude you from covering those adult topics. It's just the way that you do it. Uh, on a, are you re it certainly stay away at this point from anything to do with ongoing court proceedings or police investigations. Again, that's you know that's where you need to be a trained journalist to do that. Um, are you making any pre reference to the private affairs of individuals? Um, is there any reference to any issues of potential criminal actions? Is it of a religious nature? You know, so there's a, a checklist here that you can kind of go through to uh, make 
sure that you are you know if you if you have this in mind as you're producing this then you're really likely to stick on the right side of the broadcasting code and just think about this in terms of it's not stopping you from doing content it's not stopping anybody from making any content it's just the guidance to do it in an accountable way and doing it responsibly so that we um you know we're not treating people unfairly or we're not uh, uh you know kind of subjecting people to material that might might be harmful so review this over the rule of thumb is is it clean is it uncontroversial is it honest and is it fair um and that is kind of the uh, the general principles for um uh, any kind of um uh, content you I, i'll make available the uh the, the 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 document that i've created which is a written version of this and uh, also i'll put these slides up as well uh, as a pdf that will go into the google uh, document the google drive there's some links here for additional content um one of the things that we are working within and we've got to set this up formally at some point it would be good to do that is the impress uh, uh, standards independent media standards and impress is the independent media regulator that came out of came out of the press scandal you know the news of the world scandal that came out a few years ago and it's a formal it's very simple uh, there will be a, uh, a, a document with the a, a page on the website with this information on there. There's a document in the, uh, the the Google folder, and it's really how can what happens when somebody makes a complaint, uh, and where does it go to, and how does it get handled? Uh, again, it's a bit just gives us a bit more structure for this. Uh, Ofcom would expect people to be able to make a complaint and contact contact somebody if there's an issue, uh, and how to contact the the producers. This will initially go to the radio stations, but as we're going to be uh, uh, using material uh, or more broadly than that, then we might want to make it uh, subject to this wider. Uh, set of uh, regulations so we're kind of belt and braces with this we've got the Ofcom broadcast code we've got media law uh, we've got the safeguarding policy uh, which is about public engagement and we've also got the impress media regulation so that's four levels uh, of of uh, framework of um, being able to do this properly and safely so i couldn't think of the word that i was looking for then right okay um i'll will um post this up onto youtube um if you've got any questions fire them away via the whatsapp group um and let us know any thoughts that you have about the kind of content that we're creating and we'll uh, catch up at some point soon as well i think a, a point where we can maybe have a good a, discussion or a couple of discussions would be useful um, but okay speak to you soon